Oh dear. <laughs> Saya Obin. People call me Bin. My name's Josephine Verati Komara. I was given that name. I was born Ang Siok Bin. Um, then it was. Then I attended a Catholic school in Hong Kong. All nuns with a chapel, and they called me Josephine Ang Siok Bin. They gave me a Catholic name. I was never baptized. I. Every time I, they wanted to baptize me, I would run up a tree or something. <laughs> I, I, I had this imagination that if the water dripped, I'd just smoke out. I know. I was, <laughs> and then it became, then one time in my life, um, it had to be Josephine Wirati Komara. That was 1960. I was too small to remember. Okay. Anyway, um, I was very satisfied with Bin and or Obin because um, coming from a Hokkien family, it's not A ah in front; it's O. Oh. So we have Robert is Obed, and then Tom is O Tom, and Bin is Obin. So I'm stuck with Obin. Um, I have become a cloth maker. Um, I'm 57 today, and I started. <laughs> um, <laughs> I started when I was 17. Anyway, to make a short story long, uh, the educational system was finished with me by the time I was 12. They thought that. I did not belong there. Um, I agreed. So uh, I, I, I was living in Hong Kong, and because my father had the first travel agency in Indonesia before Garuda, I could live in two countries simultaneously. So if there's a holiday for two weeks, say, in Hong Kong or in our school, I would come back to Jakarta. So I was living in both countries. And, I spoke Cantonese, living in Hong Kong, Hokkien with my family, English and Trokem, Bahasa Indonesia. <laughs> and my father grew up in Jawa Timur and my mother in Ma It's a big mess. It's a big mess. So I was born in Jalan Kopi in Chinatown. You cannot be more Chinatown than Jalan Kopi. <laughs> Believe me. <laughs> Believe me, it was like a very short street. Um, it was like a little, <laughs> you live on top. And you work, and you work downstairs. Um, so I guess I started earlier. Most of my friends were still in school with pigtails and attending classes, and I was already gallivanting around the world. And <laughs> um, they were very jealous. They were very. I made sure they knew what I was doing. <laughs> so, <laughs> I would go into Badui, Sumba, Jambi. Solo, Jogja, Surabaya, and it was wonderful. I take the train sometimes, uh, walk around, um, exploring, feeling out my own country, and it was wonderful. I'm glad I did that. It was quite a privilege. I don't think I could, it can be done now. But then I started collecting antiques, all kinds of things that, um, that really captured my interest. And for me, it's like, um, I would, but it was the, from all the antiques, it was the cloth, the kain, which really did something to me. The ulos from Bata, the pua from Kalimantan, the tapis from Lampo, the batiks, or the, the, the stitch dyes, the tritik from the kratons of Solo, Mangkunagara. Uh, then at one time I lived in Solo and I had the privilege to know Sri Sunan. Um, the Sultan, and he took me around town in a becha. And his favorite thing was to take STMJ, Susur Telor Madu Jamu, every night. <clears throat> he just passed away. He, he was quite a womanizer, too. <laughs> he was quite a royal character, too. Anyway, uh, that went on. And so it was around 1979, I started to make the cloth. Weaving, tenun, weaving, not batik. 
really handspun silk, raw silk, and I started making it. We had we we start, start studying. I fell in love with the cloth. I was totally mesmerized. I think I got the cloth in me, and my mother used to say, "You're a woman of the cloth." <laughs> <coughs> uh, but <laughs> so. I love to be, I love to get the antique pieces with the holes in them, because from the holes you could see the frays, the fringes, and from there you can sort of like see the technique within the cloth, between the warp and the weft, and you could see the footwork there. It was like reverse engineering. I would never take apart an antique piece of cloth unless I really want to know what's inside. You know? I understood e card. I understood all the techniques, and I realized reading the books and studying that the majority part of the entire cloth making glossary in the world exists in Indonesia, throughout all, throughout the entire region, and that really blew my mind. So it was in 1979 that I started to do the handspan cloth e card. We did not dare to do war pea cut. That's very difficult for you, for those of you who don't know, but we didn't. We did the weft tea cut. It was a thick fabric. So it was only appropriate for interior. Curtains, lampshades, pillowcases, bed covers. I think I was doing the right thing at the right time. During those days, 1970s, it was the beginning of the PMR. It was like um, investment coming into Indonesia, joint ventures. and. There were a lot of Japanese textile companies coming into Indonesia, and I think they have created Bandung now for you, the textile industry there. All the Japanese uh, fabric or textile people were all in Bandung. They joined ventured with uh, Indonesians, and they had huge mills. There were hotels, Hotel Arya Duta, Hotel Hilton, Hilton Hotel, Mandarin Hotel, so there was a great demand for interior fabrics, and I think that was what really started us out. Like I said, it was doing the right thing at the right time. It wasn't planned, though. It went, this went on. This went on. 78, 79, 80, 82, 83, 84, 85. Something happened to me in 85, which I shall not speak about here, but something happened to me, something so devastating. At the same time, I was bored because by that time, Everybody was already doing ikat, and I was bored. Um, when I first started, nobody was doing it. I, I, was, I, was, I was just bored. And then something happened, and I was down. I couldn't think. So one day, in my home, I had two big chests, Palembang chests, we call them. And in one chest, I had the entire antique or vintage textile collection of the woven, the outer islands. Luar Pulau, from Tanimbar, Flores, Batak. Then in one chest, I had a, all the batiks, Jawa. Yeah. So I had my own private exhibition. I still do that sometimes. <clears throat> so I opened the chest and spread out all the fabrics that I knew so well, who taught me so much. Then I opened the other chest, and spread out all the batiks over there, and somehow an aisle here was. Uh, I, it was just there. I didn't mean to do it. I was playing with it. I remember it was like 3 o'clock in the morning. And um, I was looking at all the fabrics. And I was sitting in the middle. And I'd like to share with you something. A big bang happened. Somebody told me that the world was created out of a big bang. For me, yes. The world of the Indonesian cloths now, for me, started with that big bang that night. I saw hand-spun, hand-woven cloth and with hand-drawn wax batik on it, the perfect cloth. I tell you why it, it, this is something, I saw it in my mind's eye, why? Because in, in those days, batik was only done on cotton and that was still imported at best. We don't have cotton in Indonesia, everything is imported, all the cotton, China, England, India, mostly China now. We used to uh, import from uh, America. But then, 
either that or on silk, imported crepe de chines, shantung, satin. Then when I saw this, this would be the ultimate Indonesian cloth. And that is what we have been doing. We have been spinning our own cloth, weaving our own cloth. And today, 2012, we have about two, 820 textures, different weaves, different. And we do our own batiking on it. We do the excruciating work that used to be on these handwoven cloths, which are textured, which is very difficult to wax. But that's not all we do. We do embroidery. We work with men embroidery, uh, embroiderers now. We do stitch dyes. We do natural dyes. We do anything under the sun that can be done to the cloth. And it is possible. And it's all done by hand. And this is all traditional. All the traditional techniques. And today we have about 2,300 workers and spread all over Java. And people are wrong when they say that this would not exist in the modern world. It will exist. There's one thing I would like to share with you. In the 1970s, coming back, we had a very dynamic governor called Ali Sadikin. We used to call him Bang Ali. I recall during the investment, the um, vast textile investments here in, in Indonesia, he foresaw that technology could very easily hurt the traditional industry. People would not know what they would be buying because the technology of printing is just too good. So he made a stipulation. He said, all traditional textiles, like the batik sogan or the, the, the peace fabrics that everybody wears in, in the entire region here, all those printed by mass production printing companies are required to have on the side of the cloth here in me textile printing motif batik this is a piece of textile printed textile with a batik motif it is the batik motif and I think um, he saw that he was conscious of it he was aware so if you go and you buy something, this is beautiful, and you say, any printing, and this is not. Um, well, if he saw what printing can do now, <laughs> both sides, I think he'd jump out in his grave. But I don't think he has any need to worry because the Indonesian uh, techniques are still there. All the cloth that you see, this, is, this was taken from our, just our latest fashion show, Jakarta Fashion Week on the 8th of November. Every piece of cloth you see here began from scratch, from yarn, stitch, spun, woven, stitched, batiked. And the clothes are all hand sewn. It is not only still possible, but very strong in Indonesia. And we are able to do something which I doubt many countries can still do. I now work for a company called Bin House. And it's, they call me all Bin House. No, it's Bin House. Um, and this is what we do. It's very natural to make cloth and then to make clothes. But I would like to do the same thing to the clothes as we have done with the cloth, hand-stitched, hand-patterning, each one, one. And this can still be done once again in Indonesia. And I thought, if we can do this, other countries can be doing this too. Um, like, batik is a Javanese thing. We have batik Medan now, batik Palembang, batik... But I think with the mental, the, the batik requires that mental template. I cannot imagine a batak doing batik. <laughs> I cannot. No disrespect. My mother's from Medan. She is too impatient. She will kill the cloth. She will. 
Can you imagine Sulawesi doing batik? <laughs> Papua? I can't. Um, but each culture has their own thing. And they should, I think that they should go back to their own thing. Because their own thing doesn't belong to anybody else and no one can do it better than they can. And I think, this is hand embroidery, it's beautiful. It's like, this took about eight months to make, just the embroidery. But this is something that I remembered my mother's beautiful um, European lace that she had, the Belgian lace that she had. So, well, because we see that, we aspire towards that, we try. Um, but every country has their own culture and their own mental template. I think that, I usually, I say to my husband, he's an anthropologist and an archaeologist, he thinks I'm nuts, but um, I say to him that every country should go back to their culture and redo it. And no one can do it as better, better than they can. And it would, pro it would give so much, so many jobs to people also. You could relearn it. People look at me and they say, Ibu, and they think that I'm traditional and I do batiks and everything. And I always tell my younger colleagues, like the madam over here just now, I said to her, tradition, adalah saya, I said, tradition is the way I am. It is uh, values, it is the way we were brought up, it is the way we do things. But modern is the way you think. It is about perspective. I don't think that people should say, this is modern, this is, I don't think that they should put it on the same. It's not an opposite of each other, I should think. So these are some of the cloths. I tried to do a close-up to show you what we have done and how far we've taken it. We are able to weave, hand-weave cloths now, which are so fine, so transparent, so thin, and I think that Indonesia is the only one who can do that. Mm, we still have a long way to go. And this is only one part of it. I've come a long way and I think I'll be going further. But I want to say, terima kasih ya. Thank you.